coffee machines are a big one. I had this like automatic, you know, DeLonghi Italian thing. It grinds the beans and, and pours it all out. We went away on vacation. I forgot to empty the, the grinds out of the coffee machine before I went away. And so all those wet grinds are sitting in this plastic tray. Uh, come back and it's just all over the inside of this machine. I mean, I literally had to throw it away. Keurigs, we see these all the time. It, they get into the drain lines, they get into the supply lines. You know, pretty much anything in life that has this rubber gasket is gonna have some potential for trap moisture and water. Michael Rubino, also known as the Mold Medic, is an international authority on mold remediation and the author of The Mold Medic, an expert's guide on mold removal. So yes, you guessed it. Today, we are going to go deep on the subject of mold. Michael, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here, Jason. So you've been, this podcast has been scheduled for a while and you've been on my mind because our family just moved to Miami and I can't tell you how many times I've heard the subject of mold come up in a conversation when we were you know, looking for a place to live. Uh, so, so mold's been top of mind. You've been top of mind. With that said, you know, we've talked about mold on the show before, but I, I kind of want to just start from scratch for everyone. Start with the basics. So let, let's start with what is mold? You know, how does it grow? How does it spread? the different types, the different types of environments it thrives in. So, so let's start with that, that first big question. What is mold? Good. Great question. Um, and actually, a lot of people don't know this answer. So it's really important that we do cover this because mold is actually two different things. It's an organism, a living organism. It's alive um, and it's part of the fungus uh, community here. And it's also a particle. And this is why people get so confused because they're like, well, mold is everywhere. When they say mold is everywhere, they're talking about the particle that the organism produces. And that's called the mold spore. Um, and why it's so important to differentiate that because, you know, we're always going to have some level of particles on, on, in our environment. However, if we get taken over by the organism and it's rapidly growing inside of our homes, rapidly producing these particles, that's when it really starts to impact our health. And I'm so glad to hear that, you know, mold has been top of mind in Miami. That means that people are paying attention. They're aware of this because so many people that I work with all the time, um, they go through years of suffering, you know, countless numbers of doctors. Uh, unfortunately, they get sick before they start to realize that this is something that they could have prevented. You know, the, the picture you painted in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of the film Alien. You know, it's just, it grows, it, it spreads, it takes over. Uh, so, like, how, how, how does it, you know, it's this living organ. How does it grow? How does it spread? So, the, it's, it's kind of like this. Um, if you look at mold like a plant, it starts to really make a lot of sense. When you have a plant, let's say a weed, because mold, mold's more like a weed. You don't want weeds, right? Um, it produces seeds. Uh, plants produce seeds. Those seeds get into a moist environment, typically the soil. Um, and then out of that, it roots and grows into another living plant. Um, mold is exactly the same way. So it has these spores. And once they have a wet environment to grow, they begin to grow um, and they become organisms and their whole job is to continuously reproduce. And so when that happens inside of our homes, because we have leaks that uh, stayed wet for too long, um, we have too high humidity that allows mold to grow. Uh, this can become a pretty big problem. And uh, I know I didn't answer this earlier, but there is over 100,000 different species of mold. Uh, so there is a lot. And there's also this complexity of certain species of mold can produce what's called mycotoxins. Um, so it really does create this whole ecosystem that we don't necessarily want inside of our homes. So if there's 100,000 plus types of mold, are there, you know, uh, a group, maybe four or five, a dozen, hundred, I don't know, that are kind of you see most of the time or not the case? Yeah, there's about 36 types of mold that we typically see in water damaged environments. So, 
you know, our main focus is, is analyzing those and looking for abnormalities because, you know, like we said earlier, yes, mold, mold is everywhere as we talked about when they're talking about the spore. So we know we're going to have some level of spores in our environment, but there are tests out there that can show you, do we have a normal amount of spores that naturally come in from outside or, or is it 10, a hundred, or even a thousand times higher than what it should be? Because once it's growing inside the home, it's going to produce a lot more particles than what would naturally come in from an open window. And so, you know, you use the example of water damage. So like water, water damage happens everywhere, whether it's like spilling water uh, from the faucet or the sink. I have kids, you know, all of a sudden, oh, wow, great. There's water everywhere uh, to something that's a little bit more serious where like a pipe bursts or there's water that, you know, there's extensive damage over an extensive period of time. Like, how, how do you think of the causes? Is it, is it just water damage? Like, because we think about mold in the home, what you see is 99% of it water damage. And if you can kind of classify, because because look, I, I, I'm trying to strike the balance of, I want people to be concerned, but I don't want everyone to freak out and start like ripping apart their walls. No, I, I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And I think um, you, you don't need to freak out. You just need to be vigilant, right? And I think when it comes to that, it's understanding how water damage does impact our homes. So we have like leaking windows, leaking roofs, pipe leaks, pipe bursts. These are obviously major water damages that cause enough opportunity for mold to grow and become a problem. Uh, things like having excess humidity, right? That presents another problem. So you, those are your major culprits. Um, you know, unfortunately, our contractors and builders are not very educated on this subject. So when people improperly build a shower, um, when people improperly connect certain plumbing systems that cause these leaks to happen, they don't realize that they're doing harm. Um, and that's kind of sort sort of the problem. It's this lack of education, this lack of awareness, that's kind of allowed certain people to, to begin to suffer unnecessarily. So you're right. We don't want to cause fear or panic. We just want to cause some education because mold can grow in as little as 24 to 48 hours. So when your kid spills a glass of water on the floor and you wipe it up, even if it was there for a couple hours, that's not going to be a problem. But if you have something that is perpetually leaking and it causes your building to be wet for more than 24 to 48 hours, that's when you really start to have problems. 24 to 48 hours is kind of the key threshold when you've got water in an area it shouldn't be. And so you mentioned humidity and you know we're in Miami, tropical climate, it's humid. Uh, but something I've learned you know, even through this show, we were, we were talking about Kenneth Bach we had on the show a year ago, and, and you said you, you treated his, his home for mold, and he lives in upstate New York. And so I, I used to think mold was a little bit more exclusive to a tropical climate, but upstate New York, not really a tropical climate. So how should we be thinking about where do we live and, and what factors really contribute to mold? Because it seems to me like, okay, tropical climate, probably a bit more susceptible, but just because you don't live in a tropical climate doesn't mean you don't have potentially a problem. Totally. I mean, I do a lot of work in LA and California too, right? And you would think, well, oh, there's never humidity there. Or how could there be mold there? You know, it happens, right? Um, with with Kenneth being in upstate New York, um, you have these these issues in New York area where there's a lot of basements, there's a lot of crawl spaces, these subgrade spaces. And when it rains, that water collects next to the foundation and something called hydrostatic pressure happens. And basically it's the pressure of the water sitting uh, against the foundation that migrates inwards because water is always trying to go to the drier side to, to evaporate. Um, and we have what's called that vapor diffusion and that increases the humidity. So when you have basements and crawl spaces, for example, you're going to need things like dehumidifiers to control that humidity and control that moisture as it comes in. Otherwise, you know, you'll create this environment where mold can grow. You know, in California, you still have roof leaks. You still have plumbing leaks. Uh, sometimes there's crawl spaces and basements as well. And these, these things can happen. So it's really just about being mindful. Um, because we haven't been so mindful about it, we haven't been thinking about it. And just like anything else in the world, when you're not thinking about it, you're not going to be able to prevent it. And so you mentioned construction and contractors not knowing 
how to maybe build or do repairs in a way that protect ourselves against mold. And I'm curious in terms of construction or when, you know, looking at a house or, or an apartment, is it a case of, you know, the, the, the age old saying, you know, we, we don't build things like we used to. It, it, is, is that really the case or, you know, have materials changed over time, have processes changed over time? Um, in a way that has made mold more pervasive or are we just more attuned to it now? Uh, I think it's a combination of everything. We have different building materials. Like we used to really work with, um, you know, real lumber. Uh, a lot of the lumber we use now has a lot of glues and it's, um, you know, adhesives that kind of bind uh, different pieces of lumber together. Now, sure, maybe it's stronger, um, you know, in some cases, uh, maybe it's necessary in some cases, but when we look at that, obviously the dynamic has changed. Um, also, the processes is a bit different. And why is that? Well, you know, for example, we're going so far into net zero energy efficiency, right? These these net zero energy emissions that we want to have as a society. But what that's doing is it's not it's not really taking into account that when we have tighter homes, the air quality is going to matter tenfold. Right, because now we're breathing in less volume of air. There's not enough air exchange, and it puts us in this position where these little problems that maybe normally didn't affect us as much now affect us much greater. So, you know, there when we change things, and again, because we're not mindful of mold and bacteria and water damage, as we change things, we're also not realizing that there's a consequence to those changes. And so, it's one of those things where 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we're going to look back and say. You know, using all of that spray foam and building these houses so tight maybe wasn't the best idea, but you know, it it takes time to kind of go through that, to experience the the consequences of that, and unfortunately, it's the consequences are, are people you know getting sicker. So, are there certain materials that are better if one wants to have a, a mold free or mold resistant or mold proof home, if you will, that that we should be on the lookout for? Yes. I mean, there's been some like uh, advancements in technologies. Like for example, there's magnesium oxide board, which people are, are opting for instead of drywall because it's not going to hold moisture the way that drywall does. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with drywall is it gets wet and forget it. It's like cardboard. It begins to crumble and grow mold and uh, cause all, all kinds of issues. But you still are going to have this equation of, well, what about behind that magnesium oxide board? What's behind that? Is there insulation there? Did that insulation get wet? Is that going to harbor moisture? Um, and so there's always going to be some sort of complexities. The strategy really should be focused more on the water management side of things. We know that the second a building is built, it literally starts to decay. I mean, this is physics at, at play here. This is gravity at play here. The building is going to move and shift. And we should have different fail safes so that as water does eventually get in, there's another way for it to get back out and not come into the living environment. Now, we have definitely made some advancements there. Um, however, it's not widely spread. It's not widely used. You know, There are specialty companies that, that go above and beyond and do some of these waterproofing strategies and these, these drainage strategies. But it's not like it's building code on every house. And that's where things kind of get a little problematic because it becomes now a luxury instead of a necessity. But in terms of materials, is it safe to say, you know, concrete, tile, just less wood and jet, like the more concrete, the more tile, the better? Is that or, or no? I mean, that's fair to say, but the thing about concrete that most people don't realize is it is it is actually semi-porous, just like wood. Wood is semi-porous too. So you will get mold growing in concrete. Um, you don't. It's not as common because there's not a lot of food source for the mold to feed off of on concrete. But you know, when you get dust and things like that, that are part of our environment, is going to feed off the dust. So you will see it. Tile is great, especially if you're bonding tile directly to concrete. And people don't realize this, but the grout itself actually helps that breathe. Um, so you do release some vapor diffusion through that. So you don't really see a lot of problems with tile uh, where you do with like wood floor or laminate on top of the slab. So there's definitely um, different things that you can do to be more mindful of this so that when you do have a problem, it's a lot smaller of a problem. Uh, unfortunately, when you use certain materials, when you have a problem, it becomes a lot bigger of a problem. So in addition to tile and concrete, what are some other materials that are, we're probably better off? And then on the flip side, what are some materials we should 
<laughs> that we should run away from if possible. It, it becomes a complex situation because it's not necessarily about the actual material. It's more about knowing how to use that material. You know, it's you have tools in the tool belt, but if you use a tool incorrectly, it's no good. Um, when you're building a wood home, you know, you want that wood to breathe. You're going to want to use like a non-permeable insulation as, as opposed to like a spray foam. Um, you're going to want to use something that's antimicrobial. There's mineral wool as an example, which would be a better alternative than fiberglass. Um, there's even uh, antimicrobial denim-based insulation these days. So there's all types of different products you can use. Um, when you're when you're building a basement, you know personally, me, just don't do it. Just don't build the basement. <laughs> don't build it. Don't build it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but some people are like, well, I have this space. I want to do it. Well then build off the wall, allow there to be air gaps behind the wall so that as moisture does come in, it's not getting trapped, uh, in between two surfaces and allows it to air dry. Um, you know, there's always strategies of using any material in the world. Unfortunately, sometimes we hire people that don't use the right strategy for the material that they're using and you end up having a problem. And I think that's really what it comes down to is you just, you, we just need to be more mindful about the consequences of how we build homes, how we maintain homes, and how we restore them when there is a problem, which is a whole other issue in itself. So I'm curious for, for your work, given you know that there's been a home building boom, how, how much of your time is spent doing remediation for someone who has a, a problem or a health issue versus someone who's renovating a home or building a home? I'm just curious how you... Well, 99% of my time is helping people who are sick. Um, that is That has been kind of the entire... That's been basically my entire career, and that's because um, I started to see patterns earlier on in my in my career um, that started to see why people might get sick, and how certain uh, industry standards were not necessarily helping them. Um, we were missing the mark as an industry, if you will. And so, you know, most people when they contact me, they're contacting me for that. One percent uh, of clients maybe are already aware and they're just looking for some information or guidance on, you know, I'm renovating this. How do I make sure that we're not going to have a problem in that renovation? Right. So there is that, but you know, that's why I became known as the mold medic, right? Because I am, I'm literally like the doctor of the home, uh, if you will. For the people you see, what are, what are some of the most common symptoms where uh, like, what, what is, what does your intake look like? Because if I'm listening, I'm maybe saying, hey, I don't feel so well. What should I be on the lookout for? Maybe I've got a mold issue. Chronic fatigue is probably symptom number one. Brain fog is another thing that people hear about, which you know obviously ties right into inflammation of the brain and inflammation of the gut, um, which tends to be a symptom of having mold and having bacteria in our homes. Um, you know, we have it causes inflammation. Uh, we have uh, skin issues, hives, rashes, eczema, all kinds of skin issues that can happen. Um, of course, we know, I think we've all know, pretty much have heard the, that it ca can cause asthma, right? That's pretty commonly known. So other respiratory issues, um, difficulty breathing. Um, and then I've seen crazy, uh, rare and extreme cases where, you know, uh, people have POTS, People have pans and pandas. They're extremely affected by air quality. You have um, autoimmune de deficiencies and, de and disorders that uh, typically need uh, better air quality or they start to have triggered symptoms. Um, Lyme disease is another big one. Like everyone who has Lyme disease, they know they, ha they have to stay away from mold. Um, and so, you know, we don't know much about what it causes. We just know that there's some correlation between a lot of chronic illness and the necessity of having cleaner air than maybe the average person might need. So I'm constantly looking at uh, how, how do I help those people uh, and figure figure out some of those things to get them some relief. Um, I had a woman who this would blow your mind. She had um, she was so sick, okay, that she was actually had a GJ feeding tube installed uh, to give her the nutrients to keep her alive. She was bedridden, wheelchair. She had three kids, a husband. Within seven days of moving out of her house, within seven days, feeding tubes gone, is walking again, completely better. I mean, we did the we did this whole video with her to share her story because it was just so remarkable how much of a transformation she had in so little time. 
And this was, this was her moving out for me to fix her house. We didn't even fix it yet. Right. So when we started to look at this, I've had clients who have had chemical sensitivity, um, EMF sensitivity. I mean, when I say EMF sensitivity, I mean, I couldn't even bring my cell phone into the, the space or she would um, have some se severe reactions. So when you looked around, there was no routers, there was no microwaves, there was everything was grounded. Um, and so the, the most bizarre sensitivities can come out of this. Um, we may not have all the information, to understand how it's happening. We're just seeing that it is happening and that these people are severely impacted by their air quality. And when we fix it, Remarkably enough, they start to get better. So you mentioned air quality a couple of times, and I'm going to go there next. But before we do, if I have some of these symptoms, what are the next steps I should take to maybe get a baseline understanding of, hey, maybe I have mole before they reach out to you or, or, or someone else to kind of bring a professional in? One of the many reasons that I had kind of developed the new product, it was, it was this exact answer to the question. Um, the way in which we've been testing our air quality, because the word air, right, it kind of ties into, oh, we'll just test the air. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second, because I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fascinating questions to ask when we dive through this. We're testing the actual dust inside of people's homes. That's the key. And the reason being is because whatever is in our air, it aerosolizes from that source, it settles back in our dust, it then binds with our dust, and it's just as heavy as our dust now. The problem is, is that our dust constantly recirculates in our air, opportunistically entering our body. If you've ever sat on a couch in front of a window on a sunny day, and you saw that ray of light peer through, and you saw all that stuff floating around, you know exactly what I'm talking about. As our dust recirculates, it enters our body, we are now basically uh, inhaling all of that stuff that is now bound with the dust. Um, and air testing, what we have found was if you test it at least three feet or more away from a source, you're likely to not even notice it. Um, the levels will be very nominally elevated. You'll think it's just a normal reaction. But if you test one foot away, you'll see that it's off the charts. So what we're noticing is that mold and bacteria, when they produce these particles, they're not actually emanating very far from the source itself. And so we don't really notice it as a problem until it enters our dust and then recirculates and opportunistically enters our body. So it changes the whole dynamic of how do we identify this in our homes now. And so dust is everywhere. You know, you, you can't run away from dust. It's not like you can move the, the, the city of the country and, and, and dust disappears. It's not the case. And so with that said, how should we think about dust and air quality and how we can really take control of the air we breathe in our home. You know, I think of HVACs as well. So, so how do you think about all those? Dust is typically dead hair and skin cells, right? Um, it's not a problem on its own. Of course, you know, having too much dust in your environment, you know, your body is fighting to remove too many particles at once. You may experience some symptoms from that. But dust isn't actually the problem. It's actually part of the solution because when we know that all these particles settle in our dust, we can analyze our dust to see what particles we're being exposed to and making sure that we're exposed to a normal amount of particles as opposed to an extremely elevated amount of particles. If you look at your body as this system that you know, you're breathing stuff in, you're eating things, your body is constantly breaking things down removing particles from the body that are not supposed to be there and flushing them out. Um, when we have too much, right? It's just like eating too much food. You're not going to feel well. Too much particles, you're not going to feel well. So it's all about controlling the amount of particles we're there. So if we look at dust as a way to screen our home, looking for things that might not be healthy in our environment, then we can trace back to where are those sources creating these particles coming from? How do we fix that? And then we'll have a clean home. And removing dust by cleaning routinely is definitely going to help with, you know, making sure we're not being exposed to things we don't want to be exposed to. And how do you think about HVACs? Well, you know, we all love HVACs, right? They make our air com comfortable. But, you know, again, you talk about consequences of everything. What we don't think about is how HVACs draw air in, condition it, and supply it back out. 
So HVACs, if you have a problem, they're going to help spread that problem and distribute it across the home. And that's why, you know, we see studies from the EPA that show, oh, I had a mold problem in the basement. And that same mold problem shows that it's all the way up on the second floor. Uh, how did it get there? Well, it's because air does travel. Uh, it recirculates and the HVAC does definitely help distribute uh, issues from one room to the next. So how do we solve that problem, right? Is that, is that the next question? Filtration. Filtration. Now, <laughs> The funny thing about this, and it's really, I guess, probably not so funny, is m many of us don't realize that filtration matters. And the HVAC companies we hire that you would think are supposed to be air quality experts, right? That would make sense. They're actually not. They're experts at putting metal together and connecting it to this machine and making sure that there's Freon going to it, but they're not actually experts in air quality filtration or microbiology. So this presents this whole other problem with them just installing filters that are not efficient enough to remove these tiny particles. Um, there is technology out there that can, and what that technology is, is, is called MERV 16. That's the highest rating filter that you can get currently in a residential home. And that technology will remove particles like mold and bacteria from getting into the system and from recirculating around the house. So if we look at it from that perspective, we could actually turn our HVAC machines now into gigantic air purifiers. MERV 16, M-E-R-V 16. Yep. And so what's your take on all the humidifiers out there? Well, you know, in some climates we use humidifiers, right? Because maybe it's a little bit of a drier climate. We want to add humidity instead of remove humidity. Um, and I think that doing so is fine, right? We all want to be comfortable. We don't want to have too dry of a climate or, you know, our skin cracks, our lips crack and other things happen. Even our structure can crack, right? So the problem with humidifiers is if you leave them on too long or if they don't have like a built-in humidistat that can turn them off when the humidity gets too high, um, they can literally cause the walls to sweat and you can have mold and bacteria growing there too. So I always tell people, Maybe it's like 25 or 50 bucks more to get the, the one that'll turn off automatically. You're, you're better off doing that because you forget to unplug that or you leave it on too long. You start doing other things and now you come back and your whole room is wet. And you don't want that. And then what about the standalone air purifiers that you see everywhere? You know, um, it's, it's a great complicated question in and of itself because obviously they're not all made equal. Um, the ones that remove the smallest particle possible are what you're looking for. Things that look to destroy or kill or, you know, all these other marketing terms, probably not uh, as effective as we think. We also have this ionization technology that many people hear about. People ask me this all the time. All ionization does is negatively charge electrons that basically pull the, the, it weighs it down the particles and force them to the floor, right? So you still have to clean them up. They're not actually removing, destroying, or doing anything that we think. Mold is going to be carbon-based, right? Just like pretty much everything else on planet Earth. Uh, when you destroy something that's carbon-based, you're still going to have some form of carbon still there, which could still impact us. We just don't know much about it right now. So, you know, kind of like if you kill the weed or kill the seed, you would still see some biological evidence that there was something there, right? It's going to disintegrate and actually mold will probably eat it and, and help it decay because that's actually what mold is designed to do in our ecosystem. So, you know, when we look at that, we have to stop trying to kill things, stop trying to destroy things. We just want to remove them. That's all. But, but it sounds like we're just better off probably investing in a MERV 16, which I just did a quick Google search. doesn't seem to be that expensive. It's like a hundred, 150 bucks. Exactly. I mean, it is, you know, some of them obviously can be more expensive depending on what they are. But yeah, I mean, you, getting a MERV 16 filter for your HVAC is going to be more economical than buying an air purifier in every room. I think that's a huge takeaway. I, I really do. Because I, I can't tell you how many people have asked me about air purifiers and then people dry and then humidifier like just all, all the all the things so to speak uh and so when I, I used to always think of mold and the bathroom and the question i have is you know i'm in the bathroom because you think about it, the bathroom you got your shower you got your bath toilet you know the sink it's, it's, it's where all the water is uh, how do you differentiate between mold and mildew? Oh man, uh, that's a great question. Well, I'm gonna I'm about to tell you some not so great news. Mildew is mold. Um, there's 
<laughs> there's no like there's no thing there's no like dystopian thing that is less dangerous it's just mold is mold there's a hundred thousand species of it and what what you're referring to mildew is typically aspergillus um mildew is uh, really considered a powdery mildew which is basically a fungus that grows on plants um, from the ascomycota kingdom and so when we think about mildew, we think of it as this like this word created to kind of make us feel better about whatever is going on in our home. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, a mold from the Ascomycota kingdom has the potential to produce mycotoxins. It has the potential to be harmful. Um, it's going to come in a different color. Like typically when people think of mildew, it's like a white or a green, you know, it's not this scary black stuff that people have been known to, to be scared of. Um, you know, and it's like anything else, right? If we have a little bit of mold in our shower, um, if it's a little bit and it's not, a, it's not a lot of it, you know, you're, it's probably not going to make as a profound of an impact on your health than if you had like an entirely contaminant basement. Right. So, you know, we have to I'll always have perspectives on these things. If you see mold or mildew, you want to just be vigilant and remove it. Right. You want to clean it. You want to get rid of it. Um, and if you do that, you're, you're going to be in good shape. If you let it fester and you think it's not this big deal, that's when you can start to have a negative effect on it. How do you think about taking everyday necessary steps to just make sure? Because it, it, to me, it sounds like, look, a little mold is inevitable. You know, you can't just say, oh, I'm living a mold-free life. Not possible. You just want to avoid the severe toxic mold that becomes debilitating. Uh, so, you know, for example, we had Dr. Ann Shippey on the show a couple months ago. And she mentioned front loading washing machines, you know, got to watch out there, make sure you leave it open for a while to let it air out. I was like, you know what? I never would have thought of a front loading washing machine as a potential mold issue. So, but, it, but, it, but it's a good takeaway because, you know, we do the wash, do the laundry. And so it's a little thing I can do to make sure this doesn't become a problem. What are other unsuspecting hotspots or areas in the home that we should just be aware of. We can do make minor changes to our routine to ensure that it never becomes an issue. What else would be on the lookout for? Yeah. Front load and washing machines are a good one. They have that rubber gasket, that rubber gasket can trap moisture in the folds um, where you'll typically see mold growing. Also the tray for the, dish, the front loading dishwasher, you put the detergents, taking that all the way out and cleaning the tray and cleaning that cavity where the tray sits highly profitable. Uh, coffee machines are a big one. And I, I know I love my coffee. So I know. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. What type of coffee machine? What, what, what are you talking about? As I drink, drink my coffee. And so I had, I had this like automatic, you know, DeLonghi Italian thing. It grinds the beans and, and pours it all out. And, you know, even, even me had this, uh, had this mold issue with my coffee machine because, you know, just because I'm smart doesn't mean that I'm not going to have an issue. Right. Um, and so I think when it comes to this coffee machine, we went away on vacation. I forgot to empty the, the grinds out of the, uh, coffee machine before I went away. And so all those wet grinds are sitting in this plastic tray, uh, come back and it's just, all over the inside of this machine. I mean, I literally had to throw it away. And it was like a, I don't know, $900 machine or something like that, right? So um, Keurigs, we see these all the time. It, they get into the drain lines, they get into the supply lines. You know, pretty much anything in life that has this rubber gasket is going to have some potential for trap moisture and water. Um, and that's almost, you know, anything. Sippy cups, um, you know, I can't tell you how many sippy cups I had to throw away with my kids that were getting moldy because, you know, again, they have these intricate rubber pieces that water gets trapped behind. Uh, we have dishwashers. Um, there's a filter in a dishwasher. I know as I'm saying that, you, uh, I can tell you this, that most people never ever unscrew that filter and check it, but those grow mold pretty uh, pretty good. There's also that rubber seal around the dishwasher that keeps the water from spilling out all over the floor. And that too has some folds where water gets trapped and mold can grow. We all know about showers, right? Like cleaning our shower grouts, important um, things like that. Our toilet tanks are another weird one um, that happens. And I've found through the, the last 10 years of inspecting homes that most homes that have a mold issue, 
if you go to their toilet tank and you take the lid off of it and you flip it over and you look on the underside of the toilet tank cover and you look inside the toilet tank, you'll find mold. Um, and usually a lot of it. And most people, you know, they only look in there when there's an issue, right? So they're not checking it. It's a dark spot. There's water there. Um, so I always love that as like a free little hack to check the, your toilet tanks. Um, what do you do if there's mold there? You shut the water supply off, you flush it, that water will remove itself from the tank and you clean the inside of the tank really well. Um, underneath kitchen sinks and bathroom sinks, we have leaks all the time. We don't, we're not realizing it and maybe there's slow drips, but that slow drip is enough to get the wood wet, which could also get the drywall behind it wet, which can create, you know, again, trap moisture and mold growth. So these are some of the, the real troubled hot spots that you typically see in people's appliances or in their home, um, things like that. So assuming someone thinks they may have an issue and not everyone can get to you or see you, you're a busy guy, lots going on now in Florida. Someone reaches out to a professional to get some help. What should they look out for? Like what does a proper inspection look like? So you can, how does someone gauge if whoever they're working with actually knows what they're doing? Cause it's a little bit of the wild, wild west with. Oh, it is the wild west. Yeah. Yeah. So I did a, I did a consult with someone yesterday and, uh, they're like, you know, I, I know I have mold. All right. But I had three inspectors come out and I spent thousands of dollars with these guys and you know, they, they couldn't really find much like some small problems here or there. Then she went and tested the dust and she brings that to me and it's like off the charts. There's like out of 36 species we talked about earlier, there was like 12 of them that were super high. Good news is, is that mold typically fights for the same real estate. So it's not like you have 12 different problems. It's, you know, maybe two or three problems, but you have 12 different species fighting over that real estate inside your walls, by the way. Um, <laughs> as I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, one guy, he did like three random air tests in the center of a room. I'm not sure what he did to specify why he chose the rooms that he chose, but that's just what he did. And based upon those three tests, he was like, you don't have a problem here. So that's one, one example. Another person didn't do the test because we already saw that the test, the air test came back fine, but then started like tape, literally taping surfaces to pull off to see if there was mold on surfaces through tape. Okay. Found a couple minor things. Again, nothing. Then she tests the dust and we find all these issues now I have her hooked up with somebody that's actually going to help find the problem. And this is why I like to start with testing the dust too, because I'm trying to put people back into the driver's seat. And so when they hire Joe Blow from Mold Inspections or us, you know, they're, they're not getting taken advantage of or paying money to not find answers. Because if you think you have a problem and you smell it or, you know, you're probably right. Um, you just need to find somebody that can help detect it. So by starting with the dust, it's like screening the home and then, then giving it to somebody and saying, these are the six species help me find where it's coming from. You're now going to be empowered to take control of the situation and not have someone say, no, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't see anything. I think this place is fine. Yeah. I think that's important. There are so many, unfortunately, so many charlatans, uh, in, in health and wellness. Um, so, so with that said, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see that people make when they're trying to remediate or just, yeah. Fix it. Yeah. Well, I mean, data is king, right? Um, I, this pretty much holds true for any industry, but without data, you don't really know which areas are worse than others and how to prioritize, you know, this renovation to make sure that you're actually improving your, your air quality or your well being. Um, so getting the right data is, is, is really important to start things off the right way and then utilizing that data, right? So uh, probably about 75% of the people I work with, they're, they're not going to do everything that they find because it would be kind of ridiculous. You know, we don't need necessarily hospital grade air quality. We just need to make sure that we're not having so many particles being created in our environments that are literally overloading our immune system and just wreaking havoc. And so to do that, we want to look at, you know, what areas are actually creating the most impact and we can, we can test for that. So for example, maybe there's an attic and maybe it's producing a hundred thousand spores per aspergillus every cubic meter. 
And maybe this bathroom, this little small little vanity leak, maybe it's only producing like 100 spores of aspergillus per cubic meter. But we obviously see that this area up here in the attic is producing way more particles that are getting into the body than this little bathroom thing. And so if we need to prioritize how we're investing money and maintaining our homes, we got to go after the big problems, not the little ones. And so it's how do you prioritize that plan? And, and it all should be done with scientific background, with scientific information, not just, well, I see it. So let's just start opening things up because quite often when people go that route, which is unfortunately how a lot of people go uh, in this field, you're not going to actually get the outcome you're looking for. So utilize scientific data. I mean, if they can't prove it to you, just don't do it. So in closing, what are the takeaways you want our audience to leave with in terms of how they think about all things mold, whether they have mold, whether they have uh, a health issue related to mold, just mold in general? Because to, to me, it's, a, it's such a black box. I, to, to your point, I think there is some developing science and data, but like, ha, ha, what, what do you want to leave? Because again, I'm so with bold, and I said this before, it's a balance of we want our audience to be aware, educated and concerned, but we don't want people to freak out. Totally. So, you know, I think most people freak out because of things unknown, right? You know, when you don't know something, it's like, it's hard. It, it, there's a lot of anxiety that comes with that. And so I think with this, we're trying to educate people we're trying to make that sure that they're knowledgeable because you can't be the adverse effect of something that you know about and can take control of. And one of the things that I want people to know is that if you are dealing with mysterious health issues and you haven't checked your air quality, you probably should because that could be the missing link that you're looking for. And so I want people to have that information because you know, so many of my clients have suffered for years before they've ever connected the dots. And that that is part of the problem. The second takeaway that I want people to have is do not test air quality by testing the air. So I know it sounds crazy, but you actually test the dust. And by testing the dust and analyzing what was once in the air that is now in, in the environment, you'll have a better sense of what you're being exposed to. And then you take that to you know one of these professionals um, and say, this is what I want you to help me find. That puts you back into the driver's seat. The second thing is, uh, the third thing I should say is, you know, get, look at the data Decide what's important to you, what fits within your budget, what your what your goal is, right? We, we don't need to break down every single wall in our home, but we want to figure out which areas are creating the most impact and, and being targeted with our investments. Um, and, you know, finally, it just know that there are strategies and steps you can take no matter where you are. If you're renting, you know, air purification, better filtration in the HVAC, uh, you know, cleaning, those are strategies that are going to it definitely help removing dust reservoirs, you know, where these contaminants recirculate, uh, big, big importance there. Um, you know, and I, I want people to have hope, right? Because a lot of people that find me, they come to me and I'm, I'm their last shot, you know, and, uh, it's, it sucks to see people, uh, struggling to that extent. And, you know, it, there, there is science, there is data, there is information you can do. And while like you, you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of charlatans, there's a lot of people that, you know, just don't operate off of the scientific principles they should be, um, you can do this the right way. So I want people to have hope and uh, not live in fear, but to be empowered to take action. Michael, thank you so much. 